Thank you very much. I hope you are suitably refreshed, <laughs> having had lunch and probably being on coffee. I thought Steve made a wonderful speech, and I thought it'd be thoroughly indigestible if I got up and said something after that. <laughs> I also could see, as a housewife and mother, that some of you were getting very hungry. <laughs> so may I now say thank you for the honor you do me in presenting me with the Reagan Medal. I think it was one of the great advantages of fate, if they come sometimes. Ronald Reagan was president in the United States. Well, I was prime minister in the United Kingdom. And as we both believed the same things, and more than that, we both had the determination, not merely to make speeches by our beliefs, about our beliefs, but to put them into practice when the opportunity arose. <laughs> so I would say that Reagan conservatives, Thatcher conservatives, and Steve Forbes conservatives all believe in the same fundamental thing. <laughs> Steve did a marvelous analysis of the Declaration of Independence. The essential thing is the right to life and to liberty and to freedom it does not come from any politician any political commentator. It comes from the great creator. It is essential to human life that we have this sense of individual liberty and human rights. And never forget, my friends, that with that liberty comes responsibility as to how we use it in the world in which we live. My friends, we have been accustomed in this century to living in a world divided into two. For quite a long time, we fought off the tyrannies, the tyrannies of Hitler, the tyrannies of fascism. We fought them in world wars, the tyrannies of Japan. We lost a lot of life in doing that. And therefore, we should the more appreciate the liberty we have. Then came the end of World War II, but the world was still divided into two, not by fascism versus liberty, but by communism versus liberty. And my friends, the more I read about communism when I was very young, the more I realized it was the most total dictatorship that the world had ever known. When I say the world is divided into two, it's divided philosophically as we believed that governments are there to serve the liberties of the people under a rule of law, which is a rule of justice based on equity and fairness. Communism believed that the people have no rights at all. They are there to serve the diktat of the communist government of the day. Can you see this enormous difference in philosophy and belief? Ours because we believe in the sanctity of human life. Theirs because they thought human life was there to serve the diktat of the government of the day. It was ironic that during war, and some of you will remember it, we had to join and combine with the Russians because Hitler attacked the Russians. And there's an old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So we were the allies of Russia for the time being. And then at the end of the, at the, end of the war, as I remember Winston Churchill saying, the Iron Curtain came down from the north of Europe, the Stet into the Baltic, across the whole of Europe. And once again, the world was divided into two. During those years, it was very difficult to get any messages into the Soviet Union. As radio and television became more pervasive, we were able to do so. And I can remember during those years when we had people coming over from Russia, uh, for sometimes from the scientific community, sometimes from the international organizations, to see us in the West. 
I can remember receiving some of them in my country when I was a Secretary of State for Science and for Education and for Research. And we had a very able astronomer coming over from the Soviet Union and I received him and we had a big ast astronomy uh, conference. I said to him, now, where's your wife? Why haven't you brought her? He said, we're not allowed to. And we found any time we got a representative over from the Soviet Union, they were never allowed to bring out their spouse. Because those who ran the Soviet Union know that the attractions of the West and its liberty and justice would be too great and they would never go back. And so we had to work for years, again keeping defense strong. And my friends, the whole political tactic and necessity of keeping strong defenses has worked in the last 50 years. In a free society, you'll find that the freedom to do research, the degree of freedom, often gives us advances and we can put those into weaponry, into advances in science and technology, greater and more far-reaching than those of a dictatorial society. And so during those years, I went from time to time to the Soviet Union. It was a strange feeling. Uh, if you tried to talk to someone in the street, they wouldn't talk easily. Unless you had experienced it, I don't think many people realize, these people had no liberty. They couldn't decide what job they would do. They couldn't decide where to live. Uh, there was no possibility of going to church. They might, in fact, have worshipped privately. Uh, and it, it, it was very risky for them to do so. And it took a long time for us to bring this, or help to bring this regime down. We never had any doubt, my friends, that in the end, the liberty granted to us by the great creator would eventually triumph. And it did. And it was a very great day when things changed just a little bit. And they had a man called Mr. Gorbachev. And Mr. Gorbachev came to see me. And people have often said to me, what was it that you found that was different about Mr. Gorbachev? And I said, well, he would talk and discuss things freely. And I had never talked to a Russian who discussed things freely. If you ask them a question, they'd bring out a big sheaf of papers, look through them and, and pull out one that had the answer, and it wasn't the answer to the question at all, but never mind. <laughs> um, you got used to it. But not Mr. Gorbachev. He came to lunch with me. He could answer and debate quite easily. And it was quite clear that by that time, they realized that our message was very much more attractive than theirs. And I think we talked, he, had, he came down to check us. We had lunch and we talked over lunch and then talked, I think, until about six o'clock at night and then he had to get back to another much duller engagement than ours at Chequers, <laughs> much duller. Uh, and so I promptly, when he'd gone, ran up, rang up Ron Reagan, said, I've had Mr. Gorbachev here. Uh, he is a bright star in the Communist Society. I don't know how far he'll go but I think he's a man we can do business with. I must tell you that in all his years as a politician, Mr. Gorbachev had only been out of the Soviet Union into the West twice, once to a conference in Canada for two days, and then to us at my invitation for six days. And they didn't know. They didn't know the richness of life both politically, philosophically, and materially in the West. And they were amazed. And I had great difficulty in convincing him and Raisa that the shops which he visited weren't filled with goods just because he was going there. <laughs> because when I had previously been to Moscow and they'd shown me a supermarket, it had been filled with goods. And when I left after about a quarter of an hour thinking how sparse were the things there, the women of Moscow set about it and emptied it within about half an hour of everything that it had because they'd never seen such great variety there. So we didn't realize the extent to which they were kept down. 
the little choice they had. And they had no idea about the extensive choice with us, and it opened their eyes when they came. And as events would happen, Mr. Gorbachev came and became the president of the Soviet Union. And then as I tell you the narrative, narrative is always so much more interesting, isn't it, than theory. Then I tell you the narrative. Along came Mr. Yeltsin, came to visit uh, London. They visited, they visited America and they visited London. And Mr. Yeltsin came in and I said, look, you know that I have seen Mr. Gorbachev many times and that I do think that uh, he, he is a good person and support him. And he said, yes, I quite understand. That is your way, and I've told him I'm coming. But the interesting thing I want to tell you was this, and it showed me that our propaganda was gradually getting through to the Soviet Union. He said, Mr. Gorbachev is, is, is a communist uh, uh, president. I want, he said, to become the first elected president of the biggest state in the Soviet Union, which of course is Russia. As you notice, 15 states, Russia is by far the largest. And he said, I'm going to put up in an election and try to persuade people to vote. And I want to become the first elected, democratically elected president of Russia. And he did. And fate plays strange tricks. And very soon, the Soviet Union fell apart and the biggest state was Russia, and Mr. Yeltsin was the elected president, and he's been re-elected since. And I was delighted, because it meant that some of our messages were getting through. Now, my friends, what has happened since? Because communism was shown to be useless as a way of life for the people, either in material standards of living, or even more important, in the quality of life. Also, of course, there was communism by that time in China, but there had always been tyranny of some sort in China. Communism came to China, and just as Mr. Gorbachev and President Yeltsin, but releasing things a little bit in Russia. So, in China, Deng Xiaoping, and now a very good man called Zhu Rongji, were beginning to release the economic freedom in China. Now, you and I know that wherever the Chinese go in the world, they're very enterprising. They start up businesses, they work extremely hard, they do extremely well. Uh, when they came to Hong Kong, Hong Kong, a British colony, we had part of the land only for 99 years lease because 99 years ago, when we wanted some more in addition to Hong Kong Island, the Chinese would only let us have it on lease and the lease finished last June. We had after the war, Chinese people came into Hong Kong. They poured in. It's a small, it's a small country. By the time we got six million there, we had to, to, to man the border and stop anyone else from coming through. This is a point I want to tell you. The people in Hong Kong were Chinese. The people, the massive 1.2 billion people in China were Chinese. Same people, same inherent talents and abilities. The Chinese people in Hong Kong, under a law of freedom, rule of law, and democracy, produced by the time we left last year, the standard of living per head of $25,000 per day. They were very successful indeed. Chinese people, the other side of the border in China, under communism, the average standard of living, $800 a year per head per year. Now I tell you that because it makes the point very effectively. You may be very talented, very able, very willing, very hardworking. You cannot demonstrate all your abilities or your work cannot be effective unless you live under a political system that honors liberty and honors justice and has it supported by democracy. And that, my friends, <laughs> and my 
friends, is a lesson of this century. And you are perhaps the foremost example because America was born in freedom. The only country in the world that was born in freedom with your great declaration of independence, which Steve analyzed so well. Now let's just shift quickly and see some of the problems we are left with now. We have proved that our system works well, but my friends, fewer than half the countries of the world are for democracies. Many uh, still, in fact, have tyrannies of one sort or another, uh, and their people do not have what we take for granted. But let's quickly look at the problems now. We, in the end, by our example, brought down the communism in Russia and the Soviet Union. But my friends, as you know, if you think about it, it's much easier to bring something down than it is to build up a new system, a new edifice, a, a, a new country based on different, a different way of living. If, as in Russia, no one has been able to be free, they've never been able to exercise responsibility, they've always taken instruction, it's very difficult to turn around and say, now will you exercise enterprise and build up your own businesses, etc. And so it is indeed very slow. And if you have not got a rule of law, and this is my message to every country that's not known our freedom, the first thing you need for freedom is a rule of law which is founded on justice, a justice which is founded on right and wrong, and which is administered by independent judges without fear or favor as to the result they find. And my friends, You can't suddenly have a rule of law. You can have a diktat of regulation. But to build up that rule of law with the sense of equity, with the sense of fairness, takes much longer. And so when Russia collapsed, and when China, uh, is still, uh, still a communist country but would like to be freer, started with economic freedom, how do you build up this rule of law as distinct from a rule of regulation? It's, it's not something we'd thought of uh, before uh, Russia collapsed. We hadn't perhaps given enough attention to it. It's something which frequently when I have people over, one starts to show them and you take them to a court and they're absolutely amazed at how indeed totally independent of government it is and how it does administer justice. So now in Russia, with no rule of law, the mafia tend to, to move in and they are having an extremely difficult time. Would you believe it if I told you that the richest country in the world in natural resources is actually Russia? They have oil, they have gas, they have diamonds, they have gold, they have all of the industrial metals, they have marvelous soil. But they're one of the poorest people because they haven't yet learned how to harness those in an era of free enterprise. But they are very thoughtful of one another. I had a group over to my constituency uh, of young people, and they went to some of our schools for about a fortnight. And then I saw them, and realizing the paucity of things they had in the Soviet Union, I had a little big zipper bag, and, and I gave them uh, uh, quite a bit of money to fill it with whatever they wanted. And they all wanted things to take back for their families. It was interesting. They're very family-minded still. I suppose when you have nothing but dictatorship from government, you rely heavily on your family, and it's one of the things which they have to teach us. And they went back with those things for their families. Absolutely delighted. And so we still have a great deal to do try to help those countries to come to concepts of law, justice, and, dict and democracy, which are totally alien. Let us just have a quick look at China, because I had to negotiate over Hong Kong with China. And as you know, wherever we have the Chinese, they are, in fact, very, very entrepreneurial. China will be much slower, in my view, 
and Russia in coming out of the dictatorship. And for this reason, everything but everything is nationalized. And when I say to them that when I took over in Britain, an awful lot of things were nationalized there. Oh, they said, well, how did you get rid of them? I said, well, first, every nationalized industry is grossly overmanned, about three people doing the job of one. And so, first thing, I was not going to have it said that I was throwing people on the scrap heap, so the first thing I did was to offer them, the first case was out of government, that if they wanted to leave that business before it was privatized, we would give them a thousand pounds, which is a lot more than a thousand dollars, for every year they had worked for that industry. A thousand pounds. So if they worked 30 years, they got 30,000. If they worked 35, they got 35,000. If they worked 20, they got 20,000. We called for volunteers. We were practically killed in the rush. <laughs> um, because as I thought, always in politics, get your human nature right. Get your assessment of human nature right. I had thought this will give them a capital sum which they've probably never had access to. And so they, they, took, they went and took this. And of course, we rapidly recovered the amount by selling off the rest of the industry uh, to, to private enterprise. And that's how we got rid of almost all of our nationalized industries. And they're privatized and doing very well. And I duly explained this to the Chinese, but they, um, that was asking a bit much. Uh, but one day, maybe. But, again, they can't always keep the messages of freedom out. And so we are left with the problems of Russia uh, coming very slowly to full freedom. The problems of China in an area in Asia, where although they have talents and abilities, they do not have a rule of law, a sense of fairness at all. This is the problem of Asia. And if you have no rule of law, you'll have a rule of corruption. If your banks and financial institutions are not subject to a rule of law, they'll be badly run. And this is why we're having problems in Asia now. So that is yet another of our problems. Those are two of the very severe problems we are left with. And then as always in politics, just when you think you've solved most things, other problems come up. The only way I can explain it is to say that evil is always with us. Some evil people will get to the tops of nations. They will want to take over other nations and have dictatorship. And so you have Saddam Hussein, evil, he tried to take Kuwait. And so you have people using Islam, which is a gentle religion. Islam, Muslim, accepts the Old Testament, accepts the New Testament with Christ as a prophet and not as a son of God. And then Islam is grafted onto it. But always you get, as with that, in religion throughout history, you've got people who have totally and utterly distorted it. So that it is something totally different. And that's what you've got now, with people totally and utterly distorting uh, Islam uh, so that it becomes a creed which has enabled them to take other people's lives and property. It happened, I'm afraid, many years ago with Christianity. We got through that stage. That is what you've got now. Uh, Iraq, you've got the dictator. Uh, in Iran, you've got the distortion, I would say, of Islam. They would say it's not, but it's... it's it's not a gentle creed when it's distorted, it's ironic. Uh, and then, of course, there, you've got also around the Mediterranean, you've got the age-old enmities. And they don't go with idealism. You've got the age-old enmities between the Palestinian people and the Jewish people. All that means, my friends, that we're never going to be able to live in a world of perpetual peace. Peace is a great boon, a great benefit provided it's not the peace of force, it's the peace of liberty. And I finish with a phrase which I learned when I was just early at university, during at wartime, looking at many of the great sayings, many of the great philosophical writers. There's one which always appealed to me among many others. That which thy fathers bequeathed thee Earn it anew, if thou wouldst possess it. That, my friends, is precisely what America is doing 
as an example around the world, and you get such a lot of help from a little place called the British Isles in England. <laughs> and if you are... <laughs> and... I don't believe in Britain being dissolved in Europe. We're far too important for that. It's the Anglo-American alliance which has done so much for the world, and I hope always will. And in the hands of some of your politicians here today, I have not the slightest doubt that that will be so. Thank you very much.